Welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you all join us today for this really exciting program. My name is Alexa Nishimoto and I am the marketing associate at Janum. And before we begin, there's just a few logistical things that I wanna go over with you. Um, please keep your mic muted unless asking a question or speaking. The Zoom host, me, will automatically mute your mic if it's on when you're not speaking. And we encourage and welcome participants to have their cameras on and engage in the conversation with the author. But please note that this is being recorded. So all participants with their camera on will potentially be captured within the recording. And if you would like to use the automatic transcription service to view captions, please turn that feature on in the Zoom toolbar down below. Additional instructions can be found at the link in the chat. I put it in the chat for you all. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. This program will run for about an hour and a half. Please use the chat to ask questions of our guest or to indicate that you would like to ask a question verbally. We will get to the Q&A section of the portion. Um, and if you have any technical questions, please message me using the Zoom chat. Also, um, please go to janumstore.com to purchase Clark and Division or any of Naomi's other books. Signed copies of Clark and Division are also available if you order by today, I believe, is the last day. Um, and I also put that in the chat, but you can go to janumstore.com to purchase it. And some exciting news, our galleries are finally open. So <laughs> visit janum.org tickets to learn about visiting the museum and our new exhibition, A Life in Pieces, The Letters and Diary of Stanley Hayami, an immersive experience that explores the life of a young soldier in the 442nd through his own writings. And as we continue to reopen, we'll also continue to offer virtual programs such as this one available to everyone. So please visit janum.org slash events to learn more. And finally, I would like to welcome Naomi Hirahara, Naomi Hirahara is an Edgar Award winning author of multiple traditional mystery series and noir short stories and a longtime friend of Janum. Her Masa Rai mysteries, which have been published in Japanese, Korean and French, feature a Los Angeles gardener and Hiroshima survivor who solves crimes. The seventh and final Masa Rai mystery is Hiroshima Boy, which was nominated for an Edgar Award for Best Paperback Original. Her first historical mystery is Clark and Division, which follows a Japanese American family's move to Chicago in 1944 after being released from a California wartime detention center. Her second Leilani Santiago Hawaii mystery, An Eternal Lay, is scheduled to be released in 2022. A former journalist with the Rafu Shinpo newspaper, Naomi has also written numerous nonfiction history books and curated exhibitions. She has also written a middle grade novel, 1001 Cranes. You can see more about her work at naomihirahara.com. So now I'm going to pass it off to Naomi. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here. I requested um, it we be in a meeting instead of just me here because I really want to see all of your faces and um, <laughs> there's some old friends. Oh, I just want to remind you though, in this format, you have to mute yourself. So go over to the left side of your screen and there's a little mute button and please press that. So, so we won't have to hear you sneeze <laughs> while I'm talking. Um, and I think the host might automatically mute you as well. So just keep that in mind. But um, it's just really wonderful to be here. And Janum, you know, Janum hosted my launch of my first mystery, um, Summer of the Big Bachi, in 2004. So that's like about 17 years. So I, I really want to thank Janum and their support um, for my books and, of course, the museum store as well. So thank you. And thanks for coming and spending your Saturday afternoon with me. So I'm going to share my screen now and go um, show you some images related to um, Clark and Division. Okay, so isn't this a beautiful cover? This is um, my first hard, real hardcover release um, with a new publisher. It's called um, Soho Crime or Soho Press. 
And I think they just did a lovely job with the um, cover. When you get your book, it's like embossed. Um, there's a beautiful map inside that a Chicagoan, Eric uh, Matsunaga, helped me with to make sure everything was located in the right place. So it's been super exciting. And um, basically, Clark and Division is the story about two sisters, a younger sister um, named Aki Ito. And it, the book follows um, the Ito family as they go from tropical, um, an area of Los Angeles to Manzanar. And then from Manzanar, the older sister, Rose, is released first from camp and goes to Chicago. Aki and her parents follow only to discover something tragic has ha happened. So now it's up to the younger sister, Aki, to find out the truth as well as to kind of carry her parents, her immigrant parents through this very difficult and tumultuous time in Chicago. Um, but like I said, it starts off in Los Angeles in a place called Tropical. And um, what I wanted to do was to read from the very beginning to you. And these, of course, are images of Tropical. And it's um, located, for those of you in Southern California, it's located near the intersection to the border of um, Glendale and Los Angeles. Rose was always there, even while I was being born. It was a breech birth, the midwife, soaked in her own sweat, as well as some of my mothers, had been struggling for hours and didn't notice my three-year-old sister inching her way to the stained bed. According to the midwife, mom was screaming unrepeatable things in Japanese when Rose, the first one to see an actual body part of mine, yanked my slimy foot good and hard. Ito-san, the midwife's voice cut through the chaos, and my father came in to get Rose out of the room. Rose ran. Pop couldn't catch her at first, and when he finally did, he couldn't control her. In a matter of minutes, Rose, undeterred by the blood on my squirming body, returned to embrace me into her fan club. Until the end of her days and even beyond, my gaze would remain on her. Our first encounter became Ito family lore, how I came into the world in our town of Tropical, a name that hardly anyone in Los Angeles knows today. For a while, I couldn't remember a time when I was apart from Rose. We slept curled up like pill bugs on the same thin mattress. It was pachanko, flat as a pancake, but we didn't mind. Our spines were limber back then. We could have slept on a blanket over our dirt yard which we did sometimes during those hot Southern California Indian summers, our puppy Rusty at our bare feet. Tropical was where my father and other Japanese men first came to till the rich alluvial soil for strawberry plants. They were the Issei, the first generation, the pioneers who were the progenitors of us, the Nisei. Pop had been fairly successful until the housing subdivisions came. The other Issei farmers fled south to Gardena or north to San Fernando Valley, but Pop stayed and got a job at one of the produce markets clustered in downtown Los Angeles, only a few miles away. Tonais sold every kind of vegetable and fruit imaginable, Pascal celery from Venice, iceberg lettuce from Santa Maria and Guadalupe, Larson strawberries from Gardena, and Hale's best cantaloupes from Imperial Valley. My mother had emigrated from Kagoshima in 1919 when she was in her late teens to marry my father. The two families had known each other way back when, and while my mother wasn't officially a picture bride, she was mighty close. My father, who had received mom's photograph from his own mother, liked her face, her strong and broad jaw, which suggested she might be able to survive the frontier of California. His hunch was right. In so many ways, she was even tougher than my father. When I was five, Pop was promoted to market manager and we moved to a larger house, still in Tropical. The house was close to the red car electric streetcar station, so Pop didn't need to drive into work, but he usually traveled in his Model A anyway. He wasn't the type to wait around for a train. 
Rose and I still shared a room, but we had our own beds. Although during certain nights, when the Santa Ana winds blew through our loose window frames, I would end up crawling in beside her. Aki, she'd cry out as my cold toes brushed against her calves. She'd turn and fall back asleep while I trembled in her bed, fearful of the moving shadows of the sycamore trees, demented witches in the moonlight. So you get a sense of Aki and Rose and their personalities. So um, how did this book come to fruition? Well, it did first start in nonfiction um, with this book that I co-wrote with my friend, Heather Lindquist, um, called Life After Manzanar, in which we followed families from Manzanar to different locales. Um, and the, the family in the, on the cover um, went to New Jersey. But it turns out um, I learned, I, I had many friends, older Nisei friends who had um, stopped in Chicago, um, lived there for a while before returning to California. And I also had some friends who were born in um, Chicago in the 1950s. But it really didn't um, occur to me until Life After Manzanar that Chicago was the number one destination of especially Niseis who were released early from camp. Um, before World War II, there were 400 Japanese Americans in Chicago. By the mid forties, there were 20,000. So um, it, it shows you how you know, big this population grew in, um, during, and it's all connected to the incarceration experience. Uh, one of the things I looked at when I was doing research was, and there's wonderful um, oral histories that actually Janum has collected called Regenerations about the quote resettlement period. But I, um, there was a Chicago Resettlers Committee and this was in the 1940s. And um, in this report, they were talking about juvenile delinquency or delinquency of young people and they were bemoaning that there were babies being born out of wedlock. There were um, abortions, which were illegal at the time. Um, there was a stick up man and uh, peeping Tom. And there was a, a sexual maniac who was terrorizing some of the Nisei women. So I, you know, being a, a mystery writer, I looked at this report and I go, my goodness, you know, I no one, I haven't seen this in the oral histories. And I just found it very interesting. And in some ways, not surprising because the average age of the newcomers to Chicago, they, they tended to be in their mid twenties. And if you get a bunch of young people together without parental supervision, who are just released from a detention center until like this very notorious town and city of, of Chicago, which was the um, number two city in terms of population in the country, there was bound to be trouble. Um, and as a result of our research, we um, came across some wonderful images. So among the newcomers to Chicago were uh, Men, young men from Boyle Heights, zoot suiters, and um, who uh, you know were walking around the streets of Chicago, and um, kind of surprising maybe the longtime residents of Ch uh, Nisei, Chicago, who were kind of unaware of of these kind of group of people at the time. So, um, and it's interesting too that a lot of these images are not in Chicago because many of the people returned um, back to the West Coast. So there might be you know, some wonderful images in people's photo uh, albums that are here on the West Coast. This um, image is um, very striking. And it, I think this was taken by the War Relocation Authority. <clears throat> I think most of us are familiar with the very pristine images of Japanese Americans. You know, they, they're happy in camp, they're happy out of camp. But I think this reflects more um, how people are more perplexed. This family had been in Tule Lake and 
<clears throat> had arrived to housing in Chicago. Um, so, so how was I going to, I, I found some interesting facts about uh, Nisei in Chicago and how was I going to write them? Who was very helpful. I knew that I needed a Chicagoan. I needed a social historian. And luckily I had a friend um, in Eric Matsunaga who <coughs> was born in Chicago, but had, um, had lived in Los Angeles for a brief amount of time. And um, so that's, I think he had a, actually, I had done something on a self-publishing workshop and he had attended. So he's also a writer as well. And so um, I contacted Eric and um, I knew he was doing a, a lot of mapping work. Um, there's, he had done a map of South Side, the Kenwood area, as well as another area, Lakeview, where there, that was more of a Japanese American community in the 50s to I think the 70s. But, but he was just starting to do a map of this Clark and Division area. So this is um, an intersection where the very early uh, Japanese Americans came in the 40s. Um, if you go there today, there's like a giant, you know, giant pharmacy stores, there's a LA tanning salon, there's nothing that um, harkens back to the time where there were multiple boarding houses where Japanese Americans lived, um, you know, straight from camp. And they did, it was a, a way station. People didn't stay there. They went off to their ne next de destination. But I picked up one book called Chicago Confidential. And in that book, they had referred to the, it was written by two white men and they referred to the area as a little Tokyo. And I mentioned that to Eric and he had, he said people who lived there never referred to it. And of course the government had said that um, Japanese Americans should not congregate. So as a result of that, there's not really a central, like quote, little Tokyo or um, any kind of um, Japanese American enclave or center within Chicago, unfortunately. Um, if you wanna know more about um, the Chicago experience, um, you could visit uh, Eric's Instagram account, Windy City Nikkei. And he has written a lot of things for Janem's own Discover Nikkei. And he has even a piece uh, called Clark and Division, if you wanna know more about the background of the area. One um, building that was actually, that's still there that I mentioned in the book is the Mark Twain Hotel. And in this hotel uh, was uh, a beauty parlor that uh, Nisei woman had started. And um, I included that in the book. I, I fictionalized it, of course, but um, in the Regeneration's oral history, um, it uh, has an interview of the woman. It's very engaging. And um, she had a, a very colorful group clientele. Um, there were cross-dressers who were in the entertainment. If you go further uh, north on Clark, it was, you know, uh, there was kind of a, like a red light district. So it was, it was an interesting group of people that came through her doors in addition to her niece clients. Um, when we were walking around uh, Clark and Division, I noticed that the Newberry Library was there and I told Eric, oh, I have to go there because Sue Kunitomi Embry, who's pictured here to the left and many of us know, you know she's an educator and an activist. She uh, fought for Manzanar to become a national historic site, um, just a legend for us here in Southern California. So I knew from oral histories that she had worked there briefly and really had a positive experience. So when we went into, I mean, I was shocked at how grand um, this library is. And uh, it's a beautiful reference library, very well known. And I just was trying to picture someone who had been in, come from Los Angeles to Manzanar, you know, the dusty uh, uh, 
area of the Owens Valley to this really beautiful library. And um, I knew that I had to incorporate it in the book. So my um, character, Aki Ito, she gets a job at Newberry. Um, Eric uh, also was kind enough to tell, take me to kind of the last vestiges of Nisei life. Um, there, there's a Nisei lounge that's not run by JAs today, but it comes from a liquor store, a Nisei tavern, a liquor store that was established um, in Clark and Division, I think in late 40s, and then moved to its present area near Wrigley Field, and it's called the Nisei Lounge. If you go there, if you Google it, Nisei Lounge Chicago, they, they have some kind of uh, really cute uh, uh, merch, you know, so t-shirts and things like that. So you might want to check it out. Um, in terms of food, there's uh, this place. Uh, it's now owned by uh, Koreans. It, it used to be um, called the Hamburger uh, King. And it was known to sir, uh, serve this dish called the Akutagawa, which is named after one of the customers. And he wanted... Um, a concoction of ground hamburger, eggs, green peppers, onions, and bean sprouts. And he ordered it all the time and everyone started to eat it and kind of spread throughout the Chicago Nisa community. And another place also offered it, but people were calling it the Oktagawa instead of the Oktagawa. So rice and bread um, run by um, Korean American couple. They were, they're kind enough to continue the tradition. So you can get an Octagala today. I went to Chicago uh, for this book a second time in 2018. And um, I uh, spoke at a program at the Buddhist. There's two uh, Buddhist temples, the main Buddhist temples in Chicago. And this one was the Bo Buddhist temple of Chicago. And uh, what was really interesting is the, the minister showed me in, uh, in the back was this altar that had been carved in um, Heart Mountain. And um, it was brought over by, uh, well, the, the Reverend Guillaume Kubose, who was the, the minister of this particular church. Um, and it, what I find really fascinating is, I think the uh, uh, Kubose sensei, because he was coming to Chicago, I think some people in camp who were his congregants wanted, followed him to Chicago as well, to this particular temple. And I think the same goes for the other um, temple as well. So that's, that was very interesting. Another place, and the guide, my guide for this uh, tour was Bob Kumaki. So I thank him. And he took me to the north area of Chicago to see the Montrose Cemetery. So for those of us in Los Angeles, we have Evergreen um, Cemetery. So this is their version, only it's a lot greener because <laughs> they have more water over there. And uh, it's just a really beautiful cemetery. And it, um, it was started by a German. So there is a section that the mutual Aid Society, this is Japanese American group. They um, created this mausoleum before World War II to hold the ashes of the indigent, um, like mostly Japanese bachelors, maybe that couldn't afford an actual resting place. So they put the ashes in here. Also during the World War II era, there were other cemeteries that would not accept Japanese American bodies. So. Montrose Cemetery was the place where um, Jap the Nikkei were, their ashes or their bodies were buried. Uh. So um, I had to, so as a result, um, I, I thought this is a really touching and important place. So this also ends up in the book as well. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's where, it, it's part of a pivotal scene where Aki meets a very important person in her life. Um, and by the way, I, I'll be taking questions at the end. So um, please hold your questions. 
I'll briefly talk about just create, this is more about the writing, um, creating character. Um, and it was because Aki was so outside my experience, mostly because she's like the younger sister. I don't have any sisters. Um, she's in the shadow of her sister Rose. So all of these things, and also just being a product of the 1930s, she lives in a mostly white area. So she's dealing with um, microaggressions. She's dealing with people really not fully accepting her. And, and it's part of her personality as well. So how do I create this character? That was my challenge. And to tell you quite honestly, it was hard. Um, my editor um, had to come back and, you know, and she pointed out certain areas where I needed to strengthen my characterization. So um, I, you, I liken this, the rewriting process as like going through my cigar box. And I don't know why, but as a kid, I re really thought it was cool to have a cigar box where you put your most important treasures. So anyway, in the cigar box, which is kind of my writing toolkit, are things that were important to me as well as things that I needed to avoid. Um, I know with my drawing, you, you have no idea what those symbols are. <laughs> we'll go over a couple of them. One thing that my editor, Juliet Graham said, um, she uh, was pointing out that um, uh, there was, um, I, I did not, almost never lets us into her psychology. She was talking about my character, Aki. And I um, figured out that I had some emotional and cultural blocks in myself because I myself am a Nisei because my mother is from Japan. So I think there's just like these things, unspoken things, you know, uh, that I, I didn't articulate uh, how Aki felt in certain circumstances. And, and also, you know, she's dealing with being released out of camp, something traumatic happening in her family. So she's in the mode where she has to take care of things. So she can't dwell on her feelings just right now. So there's, there was that aspect as well. But this is, um, um, this is a section I guess um, when she was, even before the uh, forced removal, she was uh, in this one section I, I added to kind of help readers understand where she was coming from, especially in an area, a time where she's dealing with a lot of racism. I looked down at my hands in my lap. I never considered saying how I felt about things. How could I? When I, was always, when I always seemed to be grasping in the darkness to understand where I stood. So that was to kind of help um, readers get into Aki's mind a little more. Um, another thing I learned, you know, so my editor was saying, give us a lot more insight into Aki's thoughts and feelings. So I had to really think about my own experience, this is supposed to be an hourglass, <laughs> my own experiences and make more connections. So, um, okay, so this is, this is um, one section. By this time, we understood how the world worked for us to articulate the attitudes against us would give them power and credence. We prefer to release the pain silently, let it rise in invisible balloons that we couldn't see, but we could feel bumping against our foreheads and shoulders, warning us not to stray too far from what was expected. So I, you know, I just thought for myself when I was younger and in situations like, why didn't I speak out? And, and I, I tried to um, sift that and see what applied to my character of Aki. The good news is after all this rewriting, um, Juliet said, it's engrossing, exciting to watch. So yay. <laughs> but um, these are kind of just like some writing lessons that I took away from this process. Number one, interview more people. You know, I am a journalist. So I, I actually interviewed some younger sisters um, who were kind of in the shadow of the bigger than life older sister. 
and since I'm the oldest sister, sometimes it's hard for me to think, what, what would a younger sister think? So that was helpful. To mind your own vulnerable moments, um, refer to other books, especially the classics. One thing that Juliet had mentioned because of the narration, um, she's uh, talked about The Great Gatsby and um, Nick Carroll Way, the narrator, he's, um, uh, he's totally obsessed with uh, Jay Gatsby. So in my book, Aki is very much obsessed with her older sister. So I don't know. And oh, one of my friends wrote a book recently on, on um, The Great Gatsby. So I got her on the phone. We just talked about, you know, why she liked the book and the narration. I don't know if, how much of that seeped into the book, but it was, it was fun to talk to her. And just be aware of your own emotional and cultural block. Okay, so what's next? Short term, um, just a couple of days ago, Hiroshima Boy, um, that's the last Masarai book, came out in Japan. So um, I, I'm really curious to see what the response to that book is going to be. I feel honored because that book takes place in Japan. Um, two of my other Masarai books, um, Gasa Gasa Girl and Snakeskin Shamisen, were also published in Japanese. But this book actually takes place in Japan. So sometimes um, the Japanese, they're not that keen about a uh, gaijin like me, you know, writing about their Japan. But, uh, but yeah, so we'll see. And I really like the cover as well. A short story collect, I wrote a short story uh, for a surf noir collection, The Silver Ways of Summer. It's called Off the 405. And yes, the second Leilani Santiago book, it, An Eternal Lay will be coming out next um, March. And the illustration was drawn by Edwin Ushiro that many of you know, and I'm thrilled with, so. And then uh, one of my short stories was optioned by local filmmakers, Pablo Milales, um, he's a documentarian, as well as Pam Tom, that many of you know, famous for his, her Tyrus Wong um, documentary. And so they're um, taking this short story, it's a historical too, and uh, takes place in the late 1800s in Eastern Washington. So we'll see what they do. I'm really excited. They're really getting into um, the research. Oh, and by the way, I saw that Emily Anderson is here. And uh, Emily, when my husband and I drove through uh, Eastern Washington, that kind of stayed in my mind when I wrote this short story, by the way. Uh, um, and um, in terms of, so Clark and Division is a standalone, at least it started to be. And then my publisher asked for a follow up. And so I am writing a follow up and it's going to be called Evergreen. So uh, you those of you who know LA, you probably could know where this next book is head set. Um, but I'm just, um, this particular photograph taken by New York City-based Marion Palsy just kills me. You know, it's of an Evergreen hostel. And um, this is taken in 1946. It's so different than those WRA photos. Kind of shows you the chaos, clothes is strewn everywhere. And there's like a bedpan on the floor. And there's, this is probably the Rafu Shinpo here. And just everything's a mess, right? It's just like our pandemic homes. And I think, you know, this is the true chaos. I think that many people were going through as they were being moved from one place to another. So um, yeah, so the next, there will be a follow-up to Clark and Division and it's called Evergreen. So that's the end. Um, so do we have any questions? And it, oh yeah, if you have any questions, oh, I see some. Looks here. like we got one. Mm -hmm. They said, curious about Naomi's family history. Were her relatives in camp? I've enjoyed all her books. So my father's um, 
My father's a Cuban Nisei. So he was born in Watsonville, but he was taken to Hiroshima as a child with his, let's see, four older siblings. And he has other siblings that were born in Japan. So he was not incarcerated. And my mom is a pre a post-war immigrant from Japan. So she, you know, they were, they both have atomic bomb. You know, that's why Masarai, you know, that's pretty much my, my, dad's history is contained in, in Masarai's life. Um, but my father um, has cousins, many, many cousins. There's, uh, if you look up the Redmond Hirahara house on Google, uh, you could see this, uh, the remnants of this large Victorian house that's off of the highway in Watsonville. And that was um, his aunt and uncle's homes, home. And they had, I think, 13 children. So there's a lot of here. Art Hirahara, the jazz musician, is part of that family. So he's a relative. So, um, and they went to camp in Arkansas. So, um, and they lost their ho house for a while, but was able to get it back. And my father, when he returned to Watsonville after World War II, was living in that house with his cousins. So, um, yeah, so to be perfectly honest, this, this Aki story is really outside of my immediate family's experience, but it really um, came about just from my years of, of working at Rav Shimpo and covering the redress and reparations movement in, in the 1980s and interviewing and writing, you know, books on, by like, uh, on George Aratani and other folks. Um, so yeah, so this is a true novel. <laughs> and I think since I'm an outsider to the incarceration experience, I think in some ways I have a little more freedom because I think um, camp and that whole camp experience could be quite polarizing. Like what side are you on, you know? Are you, are you pro JCL, anti JCL? Are you no, no? Are you, you know, everyone is in a different side, you know. Um, and whereas my family, they were in Hiroshima, you know. So I think, um, it, I, I think, you know, in some ways, it's, I can um, look at different sides to the issue and different um, types of individuals that are part of the story with an un, unjaundiced eye. So um, I think in some ways it's kind of helpful. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael Toyoshima, Naomi-san, will you release an e-audio version of this book? Hopefully read by you. Um, Michael, no, it's, it's out. You can... Um, get it now. Um, actually, I think some libraries have it. So you should also go to your local library if, and see if they have, you might have to uh, do a hold and wait a little bit. Um, the reader is Allison Hiroto, and she's um, related to the Hiroto, she lives in New York City, but she um, um, has relatives. She's part, she's related to Wemp Hiroto and Edwin Hiroto. Um, and she had read one of my short stories and I really liked her. I like the fact that I think she has lived in California. So, um, and I like her voice. She also read Pachinko and she's read um, one of Haruki Murakami's books, but she has kind of this brightness to her voice which I think um, reflects Aki's. Um, so once I found out the book was going to become an audio book, I quickly um, told my publisher, because my publisher had the audio book rights, that I wanted to have a say in the narrator. Um, and luckily, they hadn't chosen one yet. And the audio book company was more than happy to comply. And I will say right now um, is a better time than any other to get the right narrator for your book. Actually, Tracy Kato Kiriyama, which many of you know, she is doing audiobooks now too, which is really wonderful. 
And um, I love the reader from my Maso Rai books, um, Brian Nishi, and he is actually a Hapa. And, and so he really knows his Japanese, and he's lived in Japan, so he really knows his Japanese. And I think that's really great for actors. Like they may not look the part, you know, he doesn't look like Masarai, but he could still voice the books, which is really wonderful. And I think there used to be a time where, you know, a lot of my Asian American or Japanese American writer friends were always concerned. Would they get a reader who could pronounce Japanese words or Japanese names? And these days we don't have to worry so much. So that's a good thing. Uh, oh, Kim Yin Young, do you find Nikki from Chicago different from Nikki in California? I, I think definitely um, what's, you know, and I talked to um, Eric Matsunaga last night. Um, we were doing a virtual event from a Chicago uh, bookstore. Um, I think the fact that um, folks uh, who, you know, were in Chicago before World War II, you know, they did not have to deal with the forced removal. So um, their attitudes are going to be very different, right, from the people on the West Coast. And it, it's, you know, we in California, we view ourselves as being very open and, you know, open-minded and, you know, we kind of poo-poo the Midwest, but if you really think of it, the mo all these uh, anti-Asian legislations, you know, anti-Asian laws, uh, miscegenation laws, laws against interracial marriage, you know, they all came from the West Coast. And it's probably because there were so many of us, so many people were doing well in the fishing industry. We did well in agriculture and all that. So, you know, we were viewed as more, more of a threat in some ways. Um, whereas in Chicago, a white woman could get married to a Japanese man legally, you know, before World War II, and that happened. So I, I, I think you see more um, intermarriage um, of an older generation happening in the Midwest. Um, I think what's interesting is as the Japanese Americans came from camp to Chicago, I think the longtime people were kind of like, wondering like, who are these people? They're uncouth, they're yogores, you know, they're troublemakers, um, what are they doing? You know, they're sullying our, our reputation here in Chicago. So there might've been a little bit of those kind of attitudes, but um, I really love the Chicago Japanese American community. Um, I think that um, there's a growing, a, a, a very strong interest um, and, and in fact, I think Illinois, the state, just passed legislation that the incarceration of Japanese Americans has to be part of their school um, curriculum, which is really great. Um, let's see, Pam Tajima Prager. Thank you, Naomi, for the backstory of Chicago. I've wondered of why um, Renee Tajima Pena and her family love Chicago so much. And I did know that they could go to the Cubs games for free I enjoy your book yeah you know um if you just think about I mean people had varying attitudes toward being in Chicago and um Eric uh, Matsunaga last night explained that his grandmother had come from Fresno they had he she and her family had dealt with awful discrimination you know in terms of jobs and other opportunities there and his grandmother found great freedom in Chicago. You know, the, she, Chicago was in need of a lot of workers. Um, so they were hiring Japanese Americans. There were, of course, you know, the ceiling, you know, it was fine as long as you didn't go beyond a certain level. And there was also some, because um, Chicago is a big labor, a union town, right? And in some cases, the union leaders were not informed that all these workers were going to be coming from the 10, you know, incarceration camps. So there was some kind of um, tension at times, but um, yeah. So in like Eric Matsunaga's grandmother's case, she, she loved Chicago. So everybody's gonna, 
I, I think in my book, Clark and Division, I wanted to show a variety of responses of people being in that situation. Um, let's see, Kathy writes, are you working on any more nonfiction books or are the mysteries keeping you too busy? I am, um, I'm, I just finished or I'm finishing a book for a writer for hire for um, a publishing house called Running Press, which my agent is now an editor in the children's. And I'm, I'm working on 30 like inspiring it's like we are here, 30 inspiring Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So they're profiles, um, short profiles. So um, I'm really, I really enjoyed working on that because I did, I didn't know a lot of the individuals. Um, 15 out of 30 are actually Pacific Islanders. So between um, Leilani Santiago and working on that book, my knowledge of the Pacific Islander experience has really deepened. And yeah. Uh, Michael asks, are any more Ellie Rush books? Again, e audio. Yeah, you know, the Ellie Rush books. Okay, that one, my publisher, Penguin, I guess it's Penguin Random House, they own the audio books. We were trying to get the rights because we wanted to sell them ourselves, but um, they don't want to release them. But they're not really doing it. They're not making audio books, but they don't want to release the rights because they're waiting to see if something big happens to them. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I don't know about Ellie. I, you know, it's hard. I'll be perfectly honest. It's hard right now to write about law enforcement unless you're doing, you know, how messed up it is. <laughs> and so it, it's a very sensitive issue. So um, I think I'm kind of releasing Ellie Rush right now, but you never know what will happen in the future. Ellie Rush, by the way, is related to Leilani Santiago. Um, their grandmothers are sisters. So I was hoping to bring Ellie Rush to Hawaii, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but we'll see. Uh, hi, Nim. Would you consider writing about the roots of Rafu Shimpo history, transition to digital age? Newspapers are at risk of disappearing, scary project. I know. You know, there is um, a book already by Katie Hayashi on, about the roots of Rough Shimpo. And then um, I think uh, George Johnston is uh, really interested in history as well. Um, but it is a super scary prospect that, um, you know, I, I hope, you know, Rob Shimpo was started in 1903 and we want it to continue. I think uh, if a community is without a newspaper, you know, I, we know about websites and all that stuff, but there's something about a newspaper of, of that uh, uh, legacy that's so important. So I don't think I'm the person to write about it. However, in most of my books, I have a journalist. And in many of the Masarais, they mentioned the Rafu Shimpo. And in fact, many of you know, Mario Reyes, the photographer has appeared in at least two. <laughs> Masako Miki, hi, I just finished reading the Japanese translation of Hiroshima Boy. How did you get this? It was an amazing translation with, oh, Hiroshima dialect. Oh, okay. My question is what made you write your name in kanji rather than katakana this time? Masako-san, can you, can we unmute Masako-san? Yes. <laughs> uh, can you just explain to people who might not, well, how did you get the book? So uh, Kindle. Today? And you read it already? It just came out. <laughs> yes, I bought it yes, last night and uh, couldn't stop reading. So I read all night and <laughs> finished this morning. <laughs> I'm so glad they used Hiroshima dialect. Yes, it was. Uh, Amazing captures uh, captures well the Hiroshima dialect and especially there are different dialects in Hiroshima, but they also did a great job. Yeah, I heard she's a very good translator. I don't have the book yet. My um, the Japanese agent said she's going to go back into the office on the ninth, but I'm going to go to Kinokuniya. Oh, can I do a Kindle? Can I get a Kindle on my? Can I get a Japanese book on my Kindle? I believe so, but I'm, 
I, I, I used my Japanese Kindles. I'm not connected mm. to Japanese Kindle to the US one. Okay. Um, okay, but so I, they never asked me with my first two, my uh, Gatsu Gatsu Girl and Snakeskin Shamisen, they never asked me for my kanji or I thought maybe I'd give it to them, but they just used my kat katakana, right? The phonetic alphabet because that shows people that I'm a foreigner, right? The use of katakana. But they never asked me. It was just assumed because I'm a gaijin, I'm an American. So we'll use the, the katakana tells everyone that I'm a foreigner. But this time around, I asked my editor, I said, can you use my kanji? Because I have a kanji, you know? And then it became kind of a big deal. Like, oh no, we can't do that because, you know, we don't do that for gaijin. I never knew it was such a big deal. So I, I was kind of like um, resignated that they would put um, katakana. But then all of a sudden I saw the cover and my kanji was on it. So I guess they changed their mind. But Masako-san, do you think they should have used katakana so it's clear that I'm a gaiji? Um, no, I think it's a good thing you used kanji, but uh, it's uh, I just felt, didn't know they never asked. So I thought it's something happened to your identity or <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure I, so, because for, for us, using kanji is a big deal because kanji is kind of a, true name you don't tell people kind of oh, really <laughs> that your soul is in kanji instead of katakana so i was just surprised well that's you know that was the name my my mother gave you know and hirahara is established you know that's the way you write hirahara in, in japan i mean my family so um yeah um so i was happy i mean it it's funny like people outside of you know, Japan don't know that it's such a big deal, right? To use the kanji. But when I see my name in katakana, it looks okashi, it looks weird, you know, because all those years of going to Japanese school, right? I never wrote in katakana, <laughs> Hirahara Naomi, I always wrote my kanji. So yeah, Th thank you for reading and thank you for your review, Masako-san. Well, then... thank, thank you so much for, uh... Because like translating in Japanese, I hope it becomes a movie too. It, it could happen. There was, to be perfectly honest, there was some interest in Japan um, to turn that book into a movie, but then COVID happened. So, you know, everything is in question, but, oh, if you could uh, write a review on Amazon <laughs> in Nihongo, what, that would be appreciated. Not that you have to, but um, yeah. these days, like, I don't know, these reviews are very important to people, um, but you can do whatever you want. <laughs> okay, I will, and also uh, Tomoka Shibazaki, the, one of the famous Japanese uh, novelists, she's also reading uh, Hiroshima Boy right now too. Is that your friend? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Thank you for recommending it. No, she's also has a roots to Hiroshima, so. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really eager I think it was in Shugoku Shimbun, um, the Hiroshima paper. And I'm going to be interviewed by um, Kyodo News about the book. Um, actually, the reporter used to work for Raf Shimpo, the Japanese section. So um, you never know <laughs> where your contacts will take you. Let's see. David Fujioka asked, do you ever use your husband as a sounding board during your writing process? He is very useful about cars. So if I have a question about a car, I ask him. Oh, he's very good about sports. So on um, Sayonara Slam, when I was talking to him about, I think I wanted a female presence in the Sayonara Slam. And then he was talking about a knuckle, that she could be a knuckleball pitch. Well, I knew there was this Aaron, this uh, Japanese woman who was a knuckleball pitcher, but then he was explaining, but she couldn't be on this, the, the world championship team. But my husband said, oh, but she could be a coach for the Japanese team to face a knuckleball pitcher in the Korean team. So, you know, he was very key 
is very key for that. <laughs> but a lot of times he doesn't read my books in, until they're published. So, um, and he hasn't read all my books. <laughs> uh, Naomi's book was featured on the front page of today's Washington Post. Yes, thank you. And there should have been an ad. Did you see an advertisement there? I hope. Um, that's one thing I asked my publisher. They were telling me, oh, we're going to do it all digital. But I said, you know what? It'd be nice if you put an ad in an ethnic newspaper, you know. So um, I think they did that. And um, they did that too. Random House did it for some of the Bibachi, um, which uh, was good. And I told them, you know, the cost of an ad in like Rough Shimpo is very small compared to like a big newspaper, right? So just, just fork out the money and do it. <laughs> so I think, you know, for us ethnic um, creatives, you know, sometimes we need to educate our mainstream publishers, you know, and try to divert money, you know, towards our ethnic organizations. Emily says, you're lucky my parents didn't give me kanji or middle name. Oh, I only have katakana. Oh, I'm sorry, Emily. Emily, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Wendy, have you received any feedback from readers in Chicago as to the accuracy of historic details in Clark and Division? Um, so I had reader, a lot of readers. Um, Eric Matsunaga, he read my book two times. Um, and was so helpful. Um, and then I had Bob Kumaki read it as well. I probably should have gotten a woman um, from Chicago to read it. But I tell people, like, um, show, you know, have as many people as possible read your work before publication. It, it can't hurt, you know. And um, sometimes people are shy, but people, it, it's interesting. I had um, so many different readers. I had Art Hansen read it for Brian Nia read it. Um, yeah, a lot of men. <laughs> so a lot of people had uh, read the book um, and, and each one pointed out um, a different thing that was incorrect, but they both didn't say it, you know? So it's so interesting. The thing that um, I missed, um, what, and then it was in the advanced reading copy um, and was that Aki opens a beer with a tab. Mm -hmm. And in the 40s, they didn't have tabs. I thought I had done research on this, but somehow it slipped through my fingers. And um, many, many people, including Mar Maria Kwong, you know, wrote me emails. Oh, Naomi, I hate to tell you this. Da, 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 da. You know, they didn't have tabs. But I cor we corrected it for the final book. But I'm glad we did because I would have probably received a hundred emails by now mm. about that mistake. That's why it's so hard to write a historic novel. Because and then my novel takes place in LA, then Camp, Manzanar, and then Chicago. You know, and then so uh, I could get all of those different experiences wrong. And then the time period, it it's it's terrible. <laughs> so um but yeah, uh, so it's good to have different people read it. One of the, actually one of the first individuals to catch the, the beer um, tab error was another writer for Soho. Um, his name's James Ben. And he writes a series of uh, mysteries set during World War II. So, mm -hmm. so, and his next book is going to be, he's going to have a Nisei soldier in it. So this is, you know, where it's reciprocal. So I said, I can read some of it for you. And then he started, and my, um, my father-in-law was with the 10442. So um, James is putting his name. I asked my husband's approval. Is it okay if they use your dad's name in his book? And he goes, sure. So it's not going to be him. You know, the history will be a little different, but yeah, they will use his name. So this is what's so wonderful. That's why I like, I love my press that everybody is helping each other out, you know, and, and that's really nice. Awesome. Oh yeah, Shuko Akune, the actress is a Chicago. Yes, I do know her, yeah. And then actually one of my mentors, um, the late Momokoho Iko was born in Chicago too. So, so many really wonderful 
people um, are from Chicago and and there's different stories of Chicago. This is about this one area, Chicago and and in Clark and Division, which is very a, a chaotic piece. You know, this is not Chicago in the 1950s when the community was more established. Um, and I think people are more nostalgic for that kind of the 50s and the 60s. This is what, when things were very confused. So I guess um, think of it as like the pandemic, you know, of March and April of last year, you know, when people really didn't know what was going on. Oh, it's already been an hour. So I think we need to end this, right, Alexa? <laughs> yeah, does anybody have any final questions for Naomi? Looks like that might be it. Just a final remember, I put it in the chat, but you can buy the book um, at Jan's store online. And if you want it signed and personalized by Naomi, just make sure um, that you put your order in by tomorrow. And by the way, if, I don't know if you saw it, it's going to be in the pr print issue of the LA Times tomorrow, the calendar section. And it's um, it was reviewed in, you know, with other mysteries, like three other mysteries in the New York Times. So this is the first time I've been reviewed in the New York Times. So I'm really thrilled about it. Yeah. That's and so through, exciting. Yeah, and our story's getting out there, you know, so I'm, yeah. I'm really excited. There's been a lot of interest in the book. So I'm, you know, I'm happy in terms of the subject matter. We do have one last question from uh, David Fujioka says, any thoughts of doing a graphic novel? There seems to be an onslaught of new JA novels. I would love that, but you know, it would have to be generated. I have some friends who are graphic novelists. I, I could see it more with um, Masarai, um, but you know, we'll just see. I think things just organically happen. Um, there's times where, you know, I've tried to push things to make it happen, but I, I'm kind of, and I'm also, I'm kind of old now, <laughs> getting old. So I think things will just, you know, they'll, if the, there has to be enough outside interest because there's only so much like you as one person can do. So it has to kind of capture, you know, a wave that's out there. So we'll just see if it comes or not. Great, thank you. And if there's um, no other questions, I guess we can um, end it a little bit early. I just want to thank Naomi Hirahara again. Thank you so much. And for everyone for joining us today. Um, Naomi, I think it sounds like everyone and myself were all so excited to read this book. So thank you, everyone. I hope everyone stays cool this weekend and definitely stay hydrated as well. It's super hot outside. So I just want to shout out Barbara Simon. I saw your name. You were been at every single one of my physical events, and I, I'm glad that you came into this space too. <laughs> and we will have some more upcoming programs. So just um, you can check online at janum.org slash events, and we'll constantly be posting our upcoming events and programs. We'll continue to do virtual programs, even though we are open to the public right now. Um, and since this is a recording, it will be uploaded um, sometime in the near future. So if you want, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you get notifications when there's a new program or a video that's uploaded. Thanks for your support, everyone, over all these years. I truly appreciate it, you know, and thank goodness we're all alive and stay well, everyone. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you all.